inertia is the most powerful force really. Inertia is a negative force. It holds us back. It prevents us from changing things. But right now we live in a time of the greatest possible misalignment of the geography of where our resources are and the geography of where people are. And what stands in the way is the geography of borders and politics. And we need to reconcile these geographies. Dr. Parag Khanna is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Parag is a leading global strategy advisor, world traveler, and best-selling author. He is founder and managing partner of FutureMap, a data and scenario-based strategic advisory firm. Parag's newest book is Move, The Forces Uprooting Us. Just barely hot off the presses. This is a physical copy I have, but it's also available on Audible and Kindle. The Future is Asian is also a book he has, Commerce, Conflict, and Culture in the 21st Century, released in 2019. He is the author of a trilogy of books on the future of the world, order beginning with the second world, empires and influence in new global order in 2008, followed by how to run the world, charting a course to the next renaissance in 2011, and concluding with connectography, mapping the future of global civilization in 2016. I have a uh, connectography, a copy of that. He is also the author of Technocracy in America, Rise of the in Info State in 2017, and co-author of Hybrid Reality, Thriving in the Emerging Human Technology Civilization in 2012. Parag was named one of Esquire's 75 most influential people in the 21st century, and featured in Wired Magazine Smart List. He holds a PhD from the London School of Economics and bachelor's and master's degree from the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. He has traveled to nearly 150 countries and is a young global leader of the World Economic Forum. Barag, it's so good to have you. Welcome to the show. Great to see you, Mark. Thanks so much. I'm glad you could come back on uh, the last time we spoke about a couple of your books and had you on, on the podcast. And that was wonderful. Uh, it looks like you're out and about traveling today. We're doing the podcast from your car, but it's a it's a video podcast. So we'll we'll have a mix for those. Most of the listeners are on podcast format, but I'm so glad you could take the time out of your busy schedule and uh, you hold true to to who you are. You're always on the move. You're all over the place, a renowning success since this book has come out. I've seen you all, all over speaking about it um, and, and heard you, whether it's audio podcast or on uh, videos, you know, speaking to the mayor of Miami and, and many other great, great people about this wonderful book and so timely. Um, uh, uh, and I can't believe how how up to date everything is, how you just have your finger on the pulse of what's going on in, in this world. And I'm sure that's because of your, your companies, but I, I'm really glad you could take the time to be here. Thank you. Oh, such a pleasure. And, uh, you know, it may seem like everything is super timely and uh, up to the minute, but that's, uh, I mean, partially just an accident. The book was finished before the pandemic. And I took a bit of time, obviously, to update it, but not necessarily all that much because, you know, it's a long term thesis and the pandemic has accelerated some of the trends, um, even in the area of mobility. And that's obviously a great paradox uh, to many people. But uh, but, you know, now here it is. It's out and we are entering gradually, uh, painfully, that post pandemic world where I think we'll see a lot of these trends come to life around people yearning to relocate to new places, as has always been the case throughout history. So I have a couple of questions spe specifically around that. Um, with, with people experiencing this pandemic and, and seeing a lot of moving and uprooting during this time, 
do you think there are some learning lessons that they're they're saying okay well this is probably not the first pandemic that that we're uh, going to have or live through and so they're preparing like where where can we live in the future where's the best place for this are you seeing any trends or anything that that people are preparing for maybe the next pandemic, the next wave of something else and already preparing? Well, I don't think that people are focused on the next pandemic because we're still in this one. But one of the points I make is that a pandemic is just one of the big phenomena, one of the huge kinds of events that has a systemic impact on economics, on geography and labor markets, that kind of thing. But the others, of course, are political upheaval and political unrest, right? You know, we're still in an age of civil wars and state failure and conflicts. And that obviously shifts people and forces people to become refugees, for example, Syria, Afghanistan. That hasn't stopped just because of the pandemic. And the same thing is, uh, is true, obviously, of technological disruptions, which are accelerating, right? We've had globalization, outsourcing of jobs, and now digitization, remote work. All of that also enables, creates more opportunities for people to relocate to new places. And of course, there's the demographic issues, the, the imbalances between old and young in societies. And that accounts for most human migration of the 20th century is simply people pursuing economic opportunity. And obviously that has not stopped because of the pandemic. So all of these deeper forces that compel people to want to move are, as I say, really in overdrive right now. And we also have to take into account, of course, climate change. And even though most people historically move for economic reasons, there's no doubt that climate change is going to overtake all of those forces in terms of the driver, the, the driving role that it plays um, in, in migration. And that's something that of course I focus so much of the book on. Do you think, do you think people are, are uh, trying to make their lifestyles more mobile in some respects, regardless of what's coming in the future that they're able to go where where they can work the best, where they can live the best at a moment's notice so that, that they kind of might know that there's some unease or unrest uh, in, in the world and they, they want to keep that, um, that sense of security or resilience by having the ability to be mobile or to move to that place which, which they can thrive as a family, as an individual, the best as possible. That's right. And that happens both domestically and internationally. So domestically, you can see in America at nearly record levels uh, since the uh, since the big broke out. And again, it kind of betrays the notion of a lockdown, right? Because in fact, you had record relocation during the lockdown. Enough people who could afford to say, I want to move, uh, you know, to have a more spacious home in a rural or suburban area. Or People saying, I've been paying such high rent in a downtown city, you know, in San Francisco or LA, and now my job can be remote, so I'll move to a lower cost place. And ultimately, every person, in a way, has that, uh, has that right, has that ability, um, or ideally they do, to make those choices. But I think, you know, one of the things I point out is that we've got to appreciate the people who work in local, domestic services where they are pinned down to a certain place and those people deserve to have a recognition for the for the um i guess you would call it essential services that they provide deserve to be better compensated as well on the flip side to that there was actually what occurred in, in the brexit where uh, during the pandemic where those usual migrant workers that go into the united kingdom we're not allowed to, not only because of lockdown, but because of the Brexit. And so now we're kind of seeing as they merge out, out of the pandemic or kind of start to ease travel restrictions and things that a lot of those delivery drivers, even if they were going through the channel and those uh, ships and those uh, people who were doing those sometimes essential services um, are just not they they don't want to go back to work anymore. There there's just a, a a kind of a hesitation that they feel that their the lifestyle is not as good as as it was before, or that they're they've found 
they don't feel that long-term sense of security uh, in, in those positions or in that country anymore. And I, I'm wondering if it's not, I'm sure Brexit is the biggest part, but are there, are you seeing that elsewhere? And what can you kind of tell us about that, that uh, those who, who should be returning to work, but are not? It's a great point. I think there are a couple of interesting things in there. The first is that if you think about the European workers who were in the UK prior to Brexit and then left because of the uncertainty of Brexit, the UK has now realized that they need them very badly. During the pandemic, the UK realized it had a shortage of nurses and now of truck drivers. And basically, it's just been you know, a reminder of how awful their immigration policy has been. Now, why aren't the Polish and other workers going back to the UK? Well, because Britain doesn't offer those kinds of generous working conditions, and they're just offering short-term contracts. Come to the UK, work for a few hours, sure, we'll pay you a lot more than you other, otherwise would have received, but you're not going to get any benefits. But if you're a citizen of the European Union, such as Polish people are, you're entitled to certain benefits. And now that Brexit has happened for the last few years, all of them are now living in countries with better working conditions and higher salaries and fixed contracts. So why would they go back to England? So quite frankly, I don't want to be cruel here, but this is how countries learn, either the hard way or the easy way. And Britain has chosen to learn the hard way that it's better to have these essential workers um, rather than castigate them and denigrate them and consider them to be you know, unwanted extras, when in fact they are truly the lifeblood of your economy and you were very foolish to let them go and now you're not gaining them back just when you need them most. Uh, and that, that's really kind of how, in some respects, you open up the book uh, that, that migrants really make the world go round and economies go round and, and thrive and flourish. Um, can, on the flip side, can you give us any examples of places that really during this economic downturn and, and issues uh, of the pandemic and other things really thrived and flourished and, and we're seeing something totally different because they had a different structure or they were better prepared? Well, I mean, there are a few examples, and I suppose that you could break them down into big and small countries. I mean, let's take a big country like Canada. Canada has the most generous migration policy in the world and has continued, despite the pandemic, to import migrants in record numbers, right? Literally about um, you know, 400,000 people per year, an extraordinary number of inward migrants into, the U into Canada. And, um, and, and, you know, they have this commitment and they just had an election. And even in their election, you had a sort of, you know, a sort of um, re-election of Justin Trudeau. You don't have migration as a big, politically volatile, controversial issue in Canada the way you do in the United States. And I think that's a very positive thing. In terms of smaller countries, what you saw happen was that um, you had about 75 countries suddenly declare that they are going to have uh, nomad visa programs, right? And that's really remarkable. That too is a reminder that countries realized that over the past year and a half, two years, suddenly immigration dried up, right? Tourism, gone. Conference, conference uh, events, gone. So they really were suffering because we realized how vital the tourism, hospitality, and travel industries are to our economies. And suddenly, once all of those guests and tourists dried up, they realize, oh my goodness, we don't want to be xenophobic and populist and put up walls and borders. We need to do the exact opposite. We need to attract as many young people as we possibly can. We need the digital nomads. Hence, they launched these digital nomad visa schemes and they all got FOMO, you know, sort of, so they all started doing it too. So that's how you wound up in a situation where instead of two countries having digital nomad schemes, 75 or 80 countries now have those schemes. And that's a great example of A, learning from crisis, B, appreciating the importance of migration and talent, and C, this kind of really move into a new direction, a new tangent, where you know I think the new narrative is going to be openness and the desire to attract young people uh, because we realize what happens to your economy when things stand still and you don't have those young migrants and young professionals who make your country go round, who make everything work. I love that. 
so there, I'm sure there's many more forces that are, are uprooting us. And um, for example, I, I have a lot of, I'm from uh, New York originally. I have a lot of friends from New York. And I, I just know that pretty much almost every one of them moved during this time um, to another place, uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, some to Canada, as you say, um, and some to Europe. Um, and th they're all really different stories. And, and then you, you saw these reports, you heard these reports about this mass exodus from, from people in America and certain states and, and just saying, why pay this expensive rent and uh, be in a place where I'm working from home anyway, but I can work anywhere from, from home, uh, not, not pay these expensive uh, cost of living. Um, has that slowed? Has that increased? What, what, is, what are you seeing, not just in the U.S., but all over uh, during this time? Oh, I think this is just the beginning of the shakeout and fallout from this process. We have billions of young people who are mobile, and we don't know where they're going to wind up. And even the people who did make that initial move, they'll keep on moving. You know, and the theme of this book is not really about one-way moves. It's really about constant mobility and the constant search for what I call the right um, latitude, altitude, and attitude, or more formally, you know, the search for, for social, for political, and for economic stability and well-being. And that's not a search that ends in just one place, in one promised land. Um, of course, it makes sense for people to have chosen lower cost, sunnier, you know, destinations with more fresh air. But that doesn't mean that they're going to keep their job forever because the next disruption may be coming. Uh, I quote uh, the, 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 um, the British journalist Simon Cooper from the Financial Times who said, if you can do your job from anywhere, then someone anywhere can do your job. So what happens if you say, okay, well, I'm gonna leave San Francisco and I'll hop in my trailer, I'm gonna to move to Santa Fe, I'm gonna work remotely for a while, but then your employer decides to give your job away to someone in India or someone in Egypt who's a really good software programmer, then suddenly you realize, uh-oh, now I have to get this new job, but they want me to go and do training and orientation, so now I've gotta go back to some town in California. And that's the reality for most people, even if they're lucky enough to be quote unquote digital nomads. So it's a precarious existence, you know, for, for young people, even for young talent. And so that's why I emphasize that there isn't a one way street. There isn't a single answer, you know, to where you go and settle. This is not like our parents' generation. It's going to be constant movement and nomadism. Yeah, in the book, you say one future, four scenarios. And was that what you just mentioned? Are, are those the four scenarios you're talking about? Well, actually, so the four scenarios in the book are much more sort of, you know, you could say radical or extreme or, or, or um, systemic. The scenarios are really about characterizing the whole world in the future. So one scenario is what I call um, regional fortresses, right? Where the Northern continents, North America, Europe, Northeast Asia, these are regions that are rich, stable, secure. They invest in their own sustainability. They share some technology with poor regions, but they don't actually allow a lot of migration. So it's kind of like the present extrapolated into the future. And then there's a couple of scenarios I flesh out called the new middle ages and barbarians at the gate, where you have very little sustainability and uncontrolled migration, either a little or a lot. But the bottom line is it's violent, it's not done sustainably, um, and you can have resource conflicts, water wars, that kind of thing. So it's kind of a hunter gatherer, geopolitical anarchical kind of, kind of world. And um, the final scenario of the four, and the one that I hope resonates most of all with people is what I call Northern Lights. And in that fourth scenario, you have a world where you have uh, a, a relocation of populations that are in vulnerable areas, where we do a lot of technology transfer to assist popular, vulnerable populations to allow them to um, you know, do their own localized agriculture more efficiently, 
provide them with water desalination, solar power, renewable energy technologies. But where we need to, we locate hundreds of millions, if not billions of people to stable climate resilient areas in the Northern hemisphere. But again, we do so sustainably. We build new settlements that are also circular, um, you know, with, uh, with uh, renewable power, hydroponic agriculture, uh, wastewater treatment, rainwater collection, all of these things, so that we don't repeat the mistakes of the past in terms of mass urbanization. So the Northern Light scenario is unfortunately only one out of four scenarios in the book. And it's not necessarily the most likely one, but it's the one that I think we should aspire to. Uh, throughout the book, I see that you really touch upon sustainability and climate and, and the future, and that it's really not getting better. And that there's that this also is a big factor of of your lifestyle, and also why you want to be mobile, and 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 wh why there's so many so many people moving around the world as well. Um, this I do a lot with foresight and futurism and kind of speaking to organizations, international organizations about what are, what are sustainable futures? What are resilient futures? What are regenerative futures? And um, that whole, the whole basis of, of regeneration is sustainability and the solid infrastructure that no matter what happens tomorrow, the economy goes on, the energy goes on, the food is still there. You have a place that is pretty resilient and secure. Um, and not necessarily that it's, it's continuing to get worse, uh, obviously with climate change and what's happening, but uh, it's been going on for quite some time. I, I guess people are saying that there's really not one place to go and hide from climate change or to, to say, okay, this is the only sustainable place on, on the earth. Uh, it, it, it's over and over again. Um, it's, it's moving, it's constantly dependent upon those cities and those structures that are uh, building the right infrastructures to sustain that, that lifestyle. And so with this foresight that you do with your companies and the mapping and uh, in the book, there's, there's the beautiful mapping. Can you kind of, is, is there a form of a prediction? Is there a form of foresight there that you can see what some of those trends are and how, how that's looking, those cities and places that are really making that shift to provide those places of openness? That's a great question, Mark. So the thing is about scenarios is that, you know, all four of those scenarios that I mentioned earlier are kind of, they're all true at the same time. It just depends on where you are. So there are places that are being generous and open and bringing in you know, new migrants. Look at Germany since the Syrian refugee crisis. Its population has grown because of these migrants. Its labor force has grown. It's integrated into the economy. It's raised its output. It's made the most of the situation despite the tragedy of the Syrian civil war and so on. Again, a place like Canada that I mentioned earlier that it's bringing in migrants from every corner of the planet 400,000 a year. So those are examples of that. But you still have places, you know, like Russia, right? They don't have as generous a migration policy as Canada, even though they have similar size and latitude and are becoming, uh, trying to become more diversified economies. So culture plays a strong role. So the answer really depends on where you might say. But one thing that is important is, as you mentioned, cities. And what happens with thriving, bustling global cities, what they all have in common, whether it's New York or Toronto or London or Dubai or Singapore, they're always open to talent, right? They're always open to talent and they're more or less colorblind about it. And these are the places that are the most desirable places in the world. They're the most productive cities in the world, the most dynamic cities in the world. And um, they have the highest percentage of foreign born people. You know, these are very diverse, thriving melting pot places. And I think that in the future, we're going to have a lot more places like that, because you can imagine that the new kinds of settlements that I'm talking about as populations recirculate and new economies in the northern parts of the world need to be developed and cultivated. You'll see people from everywhere gathering there. And this is uh, what I write about in the book. I talk about Northism. You know, Northism is there is it's a sad fact that the northern hemisphere is going to in a way, um, you know, sort of survive climate change 
better than the southern hemisphere. But Northism is this idea that actually the people of the Arctic regions and stuff have thought less in terms of borders and more in terms of nature and stewardship of nature and protection of nature. And that's a very important thing that we should remember. And some of the towns I've been to that used to be very underpopulated and very small, tiny places in Norway, for example, now have Brazilians and Indians and all manner of people are living in these random villages in northern Norway because there's work to be done. And we're building the future. And one of the phrases I use is um, the Latin homo faber, man who makes, man who builds. And, um, you know, that's a phrase from John C. Lee Brown, who is one of the great Silicon Valley uh, pioneers. And well, my argument is that we need to really mobilize humanity to build those future sustainable settlements. And in order to mobilize them, we need to enable them to move, un uh, unlock their potential by enabling their mobility, because most people today are still trapped behind borders. Yeah, in the book, you, you actually even say homo economic and then homo faber and kind of how what it what it needs to or what would be a desirable future of how how uh, homo sapien kind of evolves an integrated participation in those cities and those places that uh, where they live to create a lifestyle, but also to build that infrastructure of sustainability that we need. Um, th there is this uh, huge war for young talent that's going on around the world. Uh, you were speaking just recently uh, with the mayor of Miami, uh, Florida, and uh, the, you know, a lot of people see Florida as a place of where retirees go, but um, they really are young, vibrant, kind of hip, hip place in many respects. But all over the world, we're seeing this, uh, this, this war on young talent. How, how do you see that applicable for, for this move and what's available? What, what kind of uh, trends are you seeing there? And, and, and Tell us a little bit more about that. Well, young people are absolutely central. You know, if this book has, has one protagonist, it is global youth, right? And uh, that's not, not one person. It's four and a half billion people who are young. And Mark, it's really very simple. If you want to be a futurist and you want to forecast the future, you don't look at the world through the eyes of uh, the elderly, you know, and uh, nationalists and parochial people. You look at the world through the eyes of young people because they will inhabit the future. They will dominate the future. Demographically, they already dominate the present. So I think that, uh, you know, I, I consciously decided to take a youth focused lens, you know, um, in this book and in this research and to look at how youth identity has become something of a common set of values around the world. And this is extremely important because in the 20th century, identity was much more national right? Old Germans and old, uh, you know, Brits and old uh, Americans and young ones see the world the same according to, to their national prism. But today what you have is this generational identity where young people value sustainability, connectivity, and mobility above all else. And they have more in common with each other, a young Nigerian, a young Chinese person, a young Mexican, have more in common with each other ideologically, ideologically than they do with their own elderly people in their own country. So identity has gone from vertical to horizontal. I love that. Uh, a lot of this has to do as well with this um, identity, uh, identification, actual IDs, passports, this global citizen concept, this how, what kind of visas and passports and, and tools are being made available for this generation move, so to say, which you also talk about in the book, um, to attract uh, this young talent, to attract those people, and, and are they the right setup? I, I would uh, make a presumption that the most, most, move to the big cities is because there's already some form of infrastructure, but it's also those uh, big cities are the ones that are that are in need because they have people who are leaving and saying, oh, there, there's got to be something better as well. And so that it's a continual rotation. So part of the, the war for young talent is that, you know, 
again, you're almost always fighting it because, you know, we were talking about Miami earlier. Right now, Miami is a quote unquote winner. Lots of young people have been pouring in since uh, the pandemic started. But, you know, a, another place could become attractive, too. And then maybe young people will start flocking there. So it's, you have to retain those young people. And part of it, of course, is the policies of those places are do they have affordable housing? Do they have access to good public services and education? Are they safe in terms of the physical environment, security? Um, you know, do they have a liberal culture, right? And, and embrace diversity. Those are things that young people want. And so, so cities that embody those virtues are gonna be the ones that attract young people and, and hopefully retain those young people. Do you see any kind of new form of uh global passports, um, nomad visas, some new things emerging that are more on a global framework of like maybe a, a UN 2020 ID. There's a lot of things going in with the WEF and the UN for these self-sovereign identifications or some um, kind of almost like a global passport discussions through blockchain and, and secure contracts. Do you see any movement or discussions in that respect and, and hope from, from those who may come from a place where they're very technically savvy, but they don't have the best uh, social services, structures, identifications, passports, visas, et cetera, a strong passport, so to say. Right, and this is a huge theme in the book, a real priority for me, something I've been pushing for you know 10 years now and I think it's an idea whose time has come, and that is the, the so-called the so global passport. Now, when you think about, um, you know, right now, those people, the billions of people who come from countries where they don't have a privileged passport, you know, um, that their, their mobility is penalized by their nationality, right? Their nationality prohibits them from moving freely. And so this is an idea where if you can share your data on a secure blockchain and only when needed, with the relevant authorities when you're applying for a job or a student visa and so forth, you you share your vaccination certificates, your records, your criminal history, financial statements, education records, employment history. This may seem like it's terribly intrusive, but remember all of this data is already there somewhere, right? But it's to your own benefit if you're from Bolivia or you know uh, Equatorial Guinea to provide this data so that if a country, you know, is willing to accept applications for migrants from people anywhere, you can provide this documentation, prove that you're a person in good standing, and maybe it'll be a lot faster to get approval because you've put everything on the blockchain, um, rather than having to go fly on a plane, save all your money to go fly just to an embassy that's not anywhere near where you're from, and then stand in front of bulletproof glass and pay hundreds of dollars and wait months and months for potential approval. We have the opportunity to short circuit and circumvent all of that and to divorce mobility from nationality. And that's the goal that I have in mind. And that's what I've tried to outline in terms of a strategy moving forward. That's beautiful. And that I, I, I believe that also plays a lot into this uh, concept of quantum people, quantum um, experiences. Uh, um, there, I have a lot of books on my shelf here about quantum quantum mechanics, and that's kind of both at the same time, on and off. And you're this global citizen, but yes, you're from the United States, or you're from India, or you're from Africa, but you're this quantum person. And uh, can you tell us, explain how how you see that? What you mean by quantum people is this id or this uh, global passport a part of that or is there much more to it well so um you know i, I really enjoyed playing around with this terminology uh, when i was developing this so you know it's the idea that you know people are going to be on the move especially young people to some degree you could say wealthy people of multiple passports and residences are on the move all the time but of course the quantum analogy is that you can know the location or the velocity of a particle, but not both. So you can know the location, the velocity of a person or the, or the direction they're moving in, um, but maybe not both because that's how much some people are moving. And, you know, to be frank, the, the, this is very important. The quantum people that I really celebrate in the book 
are not billionaires with 20 passports, right? Uh, the people that I celebrate are the um, Filipino nurses and the South Asian construction workers. They are to me the quantum people. They're the ones who are heroes. They're building entire countries. They're caring for the elderly and the sick. They're the reason why people aren't dying in nursing homes and hospitals around the world. They're building the modern infrastructure all across the Middle East and Africa. And they're the ones who are moving around all the time and they're quite used to it, right? You know, they're not flashy digital nomads. They're not software engineers. They're hardworking people who are willing to go anywhere, um, you know, to care for their families and send remittances back. And those are the real quantum people in the world. I think more and more people, going back to the Homo Faber point and the new geographies of growth in the North and all of the other disruptions, those are the people who are going to be the kind of circulating workers uh, of the world. And I think that, again, we need to appreciate them uh, and, and compensate them because they're not only taking care of us through the work that they do, but they're also sending that support and th those uh, their salaries back home to care for their families. I, I absolutely love it, and and I think you know that's that's what we uh, should strive for for this more global citizenry, this more open world, and that we see that all the time with uh, not just Philippines and. And Indians and and uh, people from all over the world going up to build up complete civilizations. The United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Dubai um, have these numerous worker camps where people come in and they work hard and they send their money home. Um, the reason I, that I kind of want to dive a little bit deeper into that model is a lot of these have become worker camps, and and we've seen it from. Apple and, and other companies where it's not necessarily a good thing for livability and worker conditions always and really needs a lot of room for improvement. But with some of these passports, these identifications with some other options, hopefully that is a situation that they can say, no, we're gonna go somewhere else that offers better working conditions and better living conditions. But uh, we've seen that over the years in, in, in India and China and, and Dubai even, where they have these worker camps uh, that are actually abhorrent conditions to live in in some respects and to work in. And uh, that's something that we really need to change um, the status or the level of, of, of inequality in people who are building these sustainable futures, but then they're not really allowed to take part of it as they're building it in some respects. And I think um, I'd like to know kind of your stance on that and how, how if you address that all, at all in the book and, and what your thoughts are on that. I do, it's something we have to track over time. You know, if you think about what's happened in countries like the UAE or Saudi Arabia, there have been improvements made. You know, I've actually personally gone to these camps. I've gone there in the middle of the night because a lot of these jobs are done at night. It's so hot during the day. This construction work is often done at night and these camps are often near the work sites and so on. So I've, uh, you know, I've tracked this issue closely and uh, got the more foreign pressure, outside pressure, or internal pressure or competition in the market has, uh, you know, sort of been spotlighted in these places the more they've started to improve their conditions, and in some cases, quite substantially improve those conditions. Um, and I think obviously that's long overdue, you know, but, but, uh, but I think that it's, uh, it's a process of learning that's going on. Um, these countries know they can do a lot better. But one of the key things is also the workers themselves who are saying, you know what, the country I come from, the economy is growing, you know, doing pretty well, I don't have to leave. And then you'll have those wage pressures and, and other kinds of pressures in these uh, host countries. So again, I think it's a, it's a process that, that evolves and it's evolving in the right direction overall. And do you, do you believe that's just a general evolution of, of humanity? Is that a cultural evolution? Is, is it a mix between the scenarios that you talk about? We, we see, and I want to give you an example so that make it a little more clear. We see uh, cities like Neom, a sustainable city in Saudi Arabia that's popping up, the Red Sea Project, and many other almost civilization frameworks, these major sustainable cities that are popping up. 
where they're thinking, what is the future of mobility? Are we going to build another airport or are we going to build something that maybe has biometrics instead of passports and contactless uh, um, futures? Are we going to build something that's 15, these 15 minute cities? And I believe you also talk about that in the book a little bit. Um, what, what is your finding on, on that direction or, or movement moving forward for the, the cities or the places of the future? Well, you know, I think it's a great point. And again, this is where history and the pandemic experience really proved to have, you know, a lot of learning value and utility um, because, you know, we learn that we want, that we value social connectivity, social contact, green space, fresh air, all of those things. And, um, and, and that's what cities are striving and competing to do. Now, a lot of people are looking at the post-pandemic landscape and saying, you know, this is the end of the city. You know, it's uh, New York is going to lose people and Los Angeles is going to lose people and so on. Well, it's not that it, the city, the city never loses, right? For 7,000 years, humans have sought to move to cities and, and congregate in cities, um, you know, because we're social animals and because there's an economic benefit and logic to it. But the, there are different cities now that are are going to really uh, thrive. It's not all going to be New York or London or LA or whatever. So I, what I do in the book is I tour around these places um, like Berlin or Toronto or Almaty in Kazakhstan and all sorts of places that are really becoming melting pots of the future because again, they're attracting diverse youth from all directions. Um, and I think that's the kind of uh, the strategy in the end that cities have to pursue. And it'll be a new roster of the top cities and most desirable cities and livable cities in the future than it has been in the past. That's one thing I really loved about the book. Uh, there's a couple great things. So right in the beginning, uh, you have a nice little acknowledgement from uh, a super author, super writer, and, and uh, almost futurist, Kim Stanley Robinson, says a real eye opener. Move makes clear that through mobility, can, uh, uh, though mobility can be for some a desperate flight for refuge, it's also for younger generations growing into a multicultural, one planet civilization, a new expression of possibility. Unbelievable statement from a, a fabulous i don't know if you've read all his books but fabulous books and fabulous future that he presents and throughout the entire book you touch I, i'm I, it's almost like you a, a, the a geography lesson because you almost touch on every place in the world i think there was not very many that you did not touch on i'm sure there was but i could not believe places that i'd never been to never heard of that you were telling us what the culture, what was going on there. So it's a fabulous read. I thank you for, for the read, but I, I wanna ask, is there any takeaways that you can give us some things that really you, you wanna say uh, with the book that maybe we haven't touched upon during our, our short little podcast here that you really wanna hit home for people to know um, going forward, uh, some, uh, not only a sustainable takeaway, but something that will kind of give them a knowledge of, uh, of to put on a different lens on globalization, on moving on the future. Well, thanks for the opportunity. And for sure, you know, I mean, part of the, the moral of the story or the lesson is that inertia is the most powerful force, really. Inertia is a negative force. It holds us back. It prevents us from changing things. But right now, we live in a time of the greatest possible misalignment of the geography of where our resources are and the geography of where people are. And what stands in the way is the geography of borders and politics. And we need to reconcile these geographies. And this is fundamentally a book about geography, kind of like all my other books, too. At, at root, but it's not about one geography, the geographies, geography of, again, resources, people, borders, and infrastructure, and bringing those together in a dynamic way that actually benefits us. Because right now, these misalignments don't benefit us. They don't even necessarily privilege that many people. They do a lot more harm than good. And nobody, Mark, not the United Nations, not the American government, not the Chinese government, not an alien invasion, 
is going to do this for us. No one is going to untangle the situation that we are in for us. We have to acknowledge it and do something about it. And that's fundamentally what this idea of reconciling geographies is all about that I get into deeply in the book. You definitely do. And you do such a, a wonderful job of that. My last question for you is a question, a twist that I asked you the last time we were on the podcast together, but it's one I ask all my guests. And you probably answered in your last, your last statement, but I, I want to ask it again just to see if it's a, a little bit different. What does a world that works for everyone look like for you? It's a great question. Well, there's two answers. One is the philosophical and the other is the sort of material. I want to hear both. Yeah. So philosophically, I call it cosmopolitan utilitarianism, right? So we treat each other with, as equals with respect, but we, and we also want the greatest good for the greatest number. And that's in a nutshell what cosmopolitan utilitarianism is about. That's in theory. And in practice, what it looks like is, again, if we really, truly care about each other, if we really have this sense of fraternity besides just talking about it if you really want to do it and you have to enable people allow people to move you have to help people adapt and i, I you know i take for example uh, you know greta thunberg you know in the book and i say look you know it's easy not easy to but but it's uh, you know easier to be leading school strikes in a rich country one that benefits from climate change of course, it's not her fault, right? You know, I mean, she's, you know, born into a privileged country. But the true test of solidarity is not, did you strike in Stockholm on behalf of the environment and then talk about the plight of people that are being afflicted by climate change? At the end of the day, there's really, for me, only one test is, did you accept them? Did you welcome them in? Did you say, whosever fault it is, this land is not my land. This land is not your land. This land is our land. And you're only truly, in my view, you know, a, um, uh, you know, embodying that principle of cosmopolitan utilitarianism, if you're willing to accept people, to move them across that border, and to enjoy the same privileges that we do. And that's what I want to see. I, I love that. In the book, you have this, you created a new term. It's kind of a mix. Uh, Geography and philosophy together. Um, geo, uh, I can't even say it. Geosophy. Geosophy. There we go. I love it. Thank you so much, Parag, for letting us all inside of your ideas. It's been wonderful. Please uh, greet that wonderful wife of yours and your your family. And I wish you all the best. Uh, that's all I have, unless you want to ask me something or have anything else that we didn't touch up on. Oh, thank you so much, Mark. It's been a real pleasure to see you again. And uh, these are great, great questions. Such a great conversation. And I look forward to next time. Uh, keep up the good work. You too. I'm sure we'll see more books from you as well. You're doing a good job. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you, Mark. Let's take care. Bye-bye. Take care.